Okay, so uh, national dialogue on race. Are we ready for a race dialogue? Uh, the answer is no, but I'll tell you why we're not ready for a race dialogue. Um, first of all, you know why is a race di why is the dialogue on race necessary? We have a shifting demography, and so we know since uh, the Immigration Act of 1965, there's been a growing influx of non-white immigrants to the U.S. So foreign-born population was less than 10 million in 1970, and it currently stands at roughly 40 million, nearly 13 percent of the U.S. population. Okay. Uh, we know that Latinos constitute a, a substantial portion of the foreign-born population. And so that's interesting when you put Latinos in the mix. So is that race? Is that ethnicity? Um, uh, but they're projected to comprise one-third of the U.S. population by 2050. Then we have uh, Asian-American population is rapidly growing. We know since the Congress repealed the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1943 and the relaxation of immigration laws under the McCarran's Act in 1952, the population of Asian origin within the U.S. has tripled over the past three decades. Uh, we know that the foreign-born population is also becoming more diverse. You have uh, immigrants from the Caribbean countries account for more than 10% of the foreign-born population. We also know that you have, uh, their, you know, black immigrants are uh, constitute a non-trivial portion of the population. And so, you know, we have this, this you know, uh, influx of non-white uh, immigrants to the U.S., and it's estimated that almost one in four youth age 18 and under is foreign-born or has foreign-born parents. So just think about it, one in four youth. And so this is why I think it's important to really have a narrative about race. Uh, here I'm showing you the percentage of whites and non-whites in the U.S. in 2000 in 2010, in 2020, 2030, 2040, these are projected. And so this line represents the 50% mark, and you see that somewhere around 2040, uh, we're gonna have a switch over, where uh, the majority population will be non-whites. Uh, so why uh, a dialogue on race is necessary? We have large gaps in views about race in this country really large gaps, in part because of what, what you said earlier when you said you were raised in a certain situation where you weren't exposed to a lot of different things about race. So for example, uh, here's a uh, national poll, ABC poll, 2009. How big a problem is racism in our society today? Whites, blacks, 72 to 85%. Uh, say it's a problem. A big problem, whites, blacks. It's pretty different. Do you think blacks have or will soon achieve racial equality? Whites, blacks. Do you think blacks will never, not in my lifetime, achieve racial equality? Whites, blacks. Personally ever felt discriminated against because of race? No surprise, whites, blacks. Folks are navigating the same country, but they have drastically different views about race. Do you think that blacks who live in your community have as good a chance as whites to get housing they can afford? Whites, blacks. Get a job for which they're qualified? Whites, blacks. Receive equal treatment as whites when they visit local businesses? Whites, blacks. From the police, experience racial discrimination. So you have folks who live in the same cities and they're living in different worlds. Okay. Sam Lucas uh, wrote that, well, he gives a nice uh, 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 concept for this. He says, blacks' descriptions of their encounters with prejudiced authorities are often disbelieved by many listeners, particularly whites. Um, uh, I'm sorry, because many listeners, particularly whites, are aware that the proportion of people who hold prejudicial beliefs is declining. This triggers the cycle of many blacks doubting the integrity and commitment to justice of their often white disbelievers, and of many whites doubting the integrity and even sanity of individuals whose descriptions of events evoke, invokes racism or discrimination. There is an asymmetry of experience which erects a difficult to scale wall of misunderstanding between communities. White folks and black folks live in two very different worlds, even if they share the same building. Uh, and there's a narrative on this. You know, you have the Nobel laureate winner uh, economist James Heckman who says that uh, discrimination is no longer a first order quantitative problem in American society. Uh, Orlando Patterson says that being Afro American is no longer a significant obstacle to participation in public life in the nation. Black folks, many black folks read this and say, what world are they living in? All right? Uh, so, why are these views so different? 
Because one, there's a narrative of colorblindness, right? We're in a post-racial colorblind society. That narrative is very powerful. And two, we really do not talk about race. So there's no fly on the wall benefit. So what I mean by that is, um, I'm, I'm not, I do not, I think that folks on both sides, whether you're white, black, Latino, are ignorant about race of other groups. And I think that that ignorance is genuine. I'm not one of these people who say, uh, whites know what they're doing. I think that there's a genuine ignorance, okay? So every group has a dialogue about race, right? So here I'm showing you a segregated black school, black children, segregated white school. You're gonna have a token black, right? Some, some black kids will be there. <laughs> so there's a dialogue about race, and we all know what I'm talking about. We know what I'm talking about. Black folks know what I'm talking about. We talk about white folks, and white folks, you talk about black folks too. Right? So there's a dialogue here, and there's a dialogue there about race. It doesn't include him, because it's probably about him, but nevertheless, there's a dialogue about race. Right? So what, what's in the dialogue here? So for black folks, they say, well, white folks, you can't trust them. They wear shorts in the winter. They don't see their privilege. They stereotype us. They're racist in denial. These are things that we say when white folks are not around. In fact, we say, it's, flip, it's flip, flip flops in the snow. Flip flops in the snow. Right? And they out there, and, and we talk about that. Right? Um, white folks have a narrative, too. What do white folks say? I don't know, because I have not been privileged to that narrative, right? Uh, I'm waiting for a white person to tell me, here's what we actually say. Um, but So there's a narrative that blacks have, and there's a narrative that whites have, but there's very little shared narrative, right? So we're not really engaging in discussions about race. So what happens is that white folks are free to establish their own perceptions. Black folks are free to establish their own perceptions, okay? Uh, so the superficial dialogue. So why do we lack this dialogue on race? One, we believe what we see. We believe what we see. If I live in a neighborhood and I walk out and I see 10 old white women getting mugged, I'm gonna say, white women are victims of crime more than any other group in the country. Despite the fact that we know it's probably black males. Right? But I don't see that, it's what I see. And it is very hard, a lot of people who teach know this, it's very hard to get people to pull away from what they see. We want to believe so badly in what we see because that's real data, right? And there's a problem with believing what you see. I have a saying that says, don't believe everything you think. A lot of it is wrong, okay? Uh, whites are scared to express true views, right? So what happens is that, um, and rightfully so, in a class on race, white folks don't have the same freedom to talk about race the way black folks do. Let's be real about it. When we see the comedians, uh, it's open season on white folks when it's black comedians. We can make fun of how they walk, talk, all kinds of hey, white people. We can do those jokes, right? White person can't do that on stage. So they're handcuffed to some degree on discussions on race. So they tense up. And if I'm white, I'm not going to talk about race with y'all either. I'm going to tense up. And so the dialogue doesn't roll. There's no dialogue. I'm shutting down. I'm disengaging. You're not teaching me anything. I'm disengaged. And so what we need to do is we need to stop being hypervigilant and being that black person that's looking for the white person, say something, go ahead, say something. We need to stop doing that because the white person needs to be free to say, you know what, when I grew up, all I saw was the black kid, everybody who got arrested was black. That's what I saw. That's data, that's real data to me. It's real. I saw black people, every, 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 everyone I saw getting arrested was black, that's real data. So what you have to do is say, okay, that's real data, but now let's have a larger discussion about perhaps why that is in your field of vision. Where are your blind spots and what are you missing? How can you interpret this data? And we need a dialogue like that when no one's upset and people are free to say what they want to say. Lack of appreciation that the same is not the same. I was on campus, Princeton one day, and I hear this girl say, Sarah, yelling across campus, and I'm talking to someone, and I turn around with my breath, and I say, oh, thank God she's white. Because if she was black, it doesn't look the same. It just doesn't look right. You know what I'm talking about. If we have pictures of people on the wall, and you guys are colleagues, and we have a picture of you on the wall looking just like that, and a picture of you, you better smile. <laughs> right? Because if you don't smile, it don't look the same. If y'all, you see what I'm saying? You look angry. Right? The same ain't the same. Right? We, we have to understand when it comes to wealth as well. Right? So if you come out of grad school, and let's say you get a job making $80,000 a year, and a white person comes out making $80,000 a year, on average, uh, what happens is that it doesn't feel the same. 
she's benefiting, she's feeling that whole 80, you ain't feeling that whole 80. You know what I'm saying? Because you don't have, you lack wealth on average, and so um, you can't exactly access the same thing she can with that 80. Because you got Keisha saying, hey, you know my car just broke down, this, that, and the other, you gotta kick back. You're not gonna benefit from your old 80. In order for you to benefit from that, you have to make a little more to get the full effect of what that's like, right? And that's, I'm talking about wealth differences here, okay? Uh, the other thing is, uh, we do not believe what we cannot see. And here I'm talking about, we don't believe it, we don't believe in social structure because we can't see social structure. And so when we see patterns that differ across racial groups, when you see that negative outcomes always seem to have the black folks, and less to white folks, uh, we tend to see it's happening to them, they did something. We don't see the structure around that. So an example of structure would be this. If I were to take 1,000 people and randomly sort 500 to Kansas and 500 to Hawaii, and come back 10 years later, where will I have a greater proportion of swimmers? Independent of people's desires to swim. Hawaii. Right, and so there's gonna be someone in Kansas who's gonna say, that ain't true because my Uncle Jerry, he grew up in Kansas and he could swim like a fish. We all know that person. They're gonna point out the exception, right? They're lacking vision for the structure. In order for you to have the same proportion of swimmers in Kansas as in Hawaii, think about what would have to happen in Kansas, a landlocked place. The, the physical space would have to be different where you have to construct more pools. People's daily schedules would have to be different, built around pools and water and finding these bodies of water. Very different in order to reach the same proportions. So now imagine in a black community reaching the same proportions of wealth and income levels and, and uh, um, employment levels as whites. Think of what would have to be transformed within that community to reach those same proportions. It's just not the same thing, right? But we don't see the structure. We just see personal effort, just work hard, work harder. So what does this mean, work harder? Here's a study by a uh, former colleague of mine, Diva Page, who's now at Harvard, and she did a study, and the numbers aren't real, but I'm just giving you just of what she did. She had, uh, she sent out fake resumes, and she wanted to determine who's, you know, callbacks. And what she did was she changed the race and criminal status of the person. So she sent out an equal number of resumes from each of these, right? The black criminal, black non-criminal, white criminal, and she saw how many callbacks happened. The black criminal received the fewest callbacks. Second place, was the black uh, non-criminal. Then the white criminal received more. In other words, the, black, the white criminal received more callbacks than the black non-criminal. So the name of the book was marked, because if you're black, you marked. Right? Now, white people, a lot of white people, and black people, can't see this. The black folks sense it. We sense it. So we say, there's discrimination, there's racism. And a lot of times we're angry, but we can't provide that smoking gun example, right? Um, and as a social scientist, I say, oh, that's easy to find, right? Here you find that clearly the only difference is the race and, and uh, employment status. There's another study where they sent out 5,000 resumes, and they were the same resume with an exception. They had Jamal, <laughs> Lakeisha, Heather, and Greg Walton. <laughs> Heather and Greg received many more callbacks than Lakeisha and Jamal. The resumes were the same. These were 5,000 resumes. That's an example. See, now, now that's data you can see. And so when I talk to people about race, and I talk to a white person who doesn't believe in racism, I say, what do you make of this? And you just stand back, just put it on the table, <laughs> and you stand back and watch them play with that. Because now they have to reconcile that piece of information, because now they can see it against their experiences, and you see what I'm saying? And so now there's wheels turning, they're thinking, they, they're gonna engage now. Uh, we don't understand this distribution versus uh, 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 probability. And so this is something that I, that I show in uh, most of my undergraduate courses. When I try to get people to understand structure, this is having a sociological imagination. So if you have 160 students, 80 red students, 80 blue students, the red students took a test prep course. And so here we have one blue dot, he scored a 50. Here we have a red dot scored an 80. Just to give you an example, each dot represents one kid. Uh, here you have 80 blue dots, 80 red dots. There is a different distribution for each. There's an average for all 160, right? But there's a blue distribution and there's a red distribution. Everything has a distribution, height, 
There's some really short people, there's some really tall people, but most people are in the middle. So that distribution kind of goes like this, all right? Bell-shaped curve. So here you have the distribution. Now, this person took the test prep course and they failed. This person didn't and they passed. We have a tendency to lean toward individual level narratives, right? So in this case, uh, when you look at this, you say, okay, that has to be a personal problem because this is the structure. In other words, this is Beverly Hills. And so in Beverly Hills, this kid got into Stanford. Okay. Huh. This kid got into Duke. Okay. Huh. Now we're in Detroit. I don't know if y'all know Detroit, but we in Detroit. <laughs> and in Detroit, this kid's going to Stanford. That ain't the same thing. That ain't the same thing because this kid had to overcome a very different structure in order to get out here. So here, this is what we call success stories. And we love to point to these guys and say, oh, bootstraps. They work really hard, right? Uh, and um, we ignore that this guy didn't have to work as hard because they're, sw you see what I'm saying? They're just maintaining. Uh, this is a personal problem because this kid's uh, father was a lawyer and mother was a doctor and somehow they out here, I don't know what happened to them, right? But this is, this is a personal problem. This is when the individual narrative could work. Here's another example of Fluentville, hood town. So here you have nice cars and here you have some potholes and for the most part people make it to the end. One guy doesn't make it. In hood town, cars aren't quite as nice, but there's going to be one middle class family that's doing well. And there are folks who make it to the end, right? These folks will look at these guys and say, they're worse drivers, individual level narrative. What's wrong with you guys? We're superior drivers. You guys don't drive as well, don't work as hard at it. They're ignoring the structural issues. They're ignoring the Hawaii versus Kansas. They're ignoring the factors external to us that influence the probabilities that behaviors occur within populations. Right? And so what happens is this guy is actually the best driver here because he had to navigate this. You know who this is? This is me. This is you. This is you. This, this, is, this is the black people in the room. You're not supposed to be here. You're outperforming your demographic. Right? And so all of us have a story. We all have a narrative. Right? And so that's, that's what's going on. Sometimes you get this guy here who's from Hood Town and says, y'all got problems. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, anyway, so another example of structure. Here you have poverty rate for whites during Ford and Carter. Poverty rates for whites, poverty rates for blacks. If we use the individual level narrative, we say blacks like poverty more than whites. Right? So I'm going to give you an example of how ridiculous sometimes the individual narr narrative sounds. Uh, they really liked it under Reagan. So they decided it was something happened in the early 80s where it was cool to be in poverty, and so they went up. Sometime around 1992, they said, ah, uh, okay, we're tired of it. And then the poverty came down. This is no statistical analysis whatsoever. It's simply what was the poverty rate for whites in this year, in this year, in this year, in this year? What was the poverty rate for blacks in these years? That's all it is. Simple trend. And then when Bush came into office, they said, okay, uh, it's close enough, let's go back up. <laughs> you see structure here so clearly that any narrative that folks in poverty like poverty, that you know, welfare queen, all that, it just doesn't make sense. In order for it to make sense, you have to believe that folks' preferences are playing into these patterns. And that's lack of recognition of structure. And that takes training, it takes, that's what you beat into students. All right, it's a structure. Final example is, one thing that people like to point out is, uh, well, look at black immigrants. They do so well. What's wrong with, what's wrong with African Americans? That's a big one, big one. Mm -hmm. Here you have Africa and the US. OK, so here's the distribution in Africa, socioeconomic distribution. You have some people who are really well off, and you have some people who are not well off at all. There's an average, OK? There's an average. You have people who are really well off and those who are not. Who along this distribution can move their family across the world? It ain't these people. They don't even have a house. 
So these people move over there, all right? Now here's the distribution for whites in the US. Here's the distribution for Africans in the US because they're not doing as well as whites. So their average is a little lower. But there still are some who are doing better than some whites. Right? And then here's the black distribution, the African American distribution. What people are doing is that they're comparing the African all-stars to the average black population. And that's not the right comparison group. The right comparison group is to compare the African all-stars to the black American all-stars. And you're not going to find any differences when it comes to wealth, income, and education. That is, how do you define this? People who are uh, movers versus non-movers. Movers are folks who live in states other than which they were born. And if you classify those as movers because it takes resources to do that, who are the movers? You live in a state in which you weren't born. I'm living in a state. We're mo many people here, right? We're the movers. And so the movers, the black movers, do not differ from Africans, who are the African movers. But that gets lost. Why? Because these Africans here don't see structure. They don't see all of this. You see what I'm saying? They just see what they see in front of their eyes. I'm African. You African American. I'm doing better. You're not. You lazy. I work hard. <laughs> That's real data. It's real data. How can you say no to that person? That's what they really see. They're not making this up. But it requires a step back to say, okay, how can I get this person to see structure and distribution? And that's where we need to go with regard to talking about race in this country. Thank you. So like Angel, of course, I'm going to use visual, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about how what I like to describe as the post-hip-hop generation is processing race around issues of protest. So the title, Marching on Twitter, Shareable Resistance and Spreadable Revolutions. For many of what we'll call the post-hip-hop generation, what we saw a few weeks ago was a memorial service for a previous generation. What is the post-hip-hop generation? I don't even know. So post-hip-hop generation, <laughs> right? And, and, and young folks will have problem with this description. I'm hip-hop generation. I'm 47 years old, <laughs> right? Meaning I was a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> when hip-hop was born in the Bronx in 1973, I was eight years old, right? I'm the first generation of young black folks to grow up with hip hop, right? And there are some folks who admit that there might be a generation after that, right? But there is now a generation of young folks in this country, 25 years of age and younger, who simply do not have the same kind of relationship with hip hop that my generation does, right? Both in terms of how they listen to it, what they value in it, right, whatever. Right, and so I, I'm looking for other language. So for this moment, I'm gonna call them a post-hip-hop generation, right? My students are post-hip-hop generation in that regard. What they saw on, in Washington a few weeks ago, in many ways was irrelevant to them, right? It was a memorial service for something that happened 50 years ago, right? About people who were present 50 years ago about people who were present 50 years ago and still present in 2013 and trying to remain relevant. Right? For some folks, it was a coronation for a reverend by the name of Sharpton. But for this young generation, they have already been thinking about their own models of resistance. So a post-hip-hop generation that redefines protests and social justice in the digital era. And here we have Philip Agnew of the Dream Defender. My name is Philip Agnew, Executive Director of the Dream Defenders. And this morning, uh, my time as well as that of Sophia Campos, leader of United We Dream, was cut from the march. But we still have much to say. They told me that 
they had run out of time, but I believe that our time is now. What do you believe? Record a video. Let your voice be heard. This is our dream. The America of today we inherited, but the America of tomorrow is ours. The world is ours. So please record your two minutes. What would you say with your two minutes? Record it, post it, and use the hashtag Our March so that we can share with the world what our generation has to say about the future of America and the dream. Whenever you're ready. By the time we finish our conversation this morning, another black boy will lay bleeding in the streets of Chicago. And as we rest our heads tonight, 300,000 of our veterans will lay their heads homeless. And I would love to explain to you how the hate we spread abroad is the real reason that hatred washes upon our shores, but I only have two minutes. And I can tell you that Philadelphia just closed 23 of its schools. At the same time, it makes way for a $400 million state-of-the-art prison in that North Carolina and Florida continue to silence their citizens at the ballot box, but I only have two minutes. I can tell you how even as we celebrate Dr. King's dream, over 400,000 of our immigrant brothers and sisters languish away in privately owned detention camps. And how we still find our queer brothers and sisters in prison in the shadows of their closets, but I only have two minutes. And I tell you how our mothers, sisters, wives, and daughters still earn less, have no control over their bodies, and are traded and trafficked like slaves. And I can tell you how it's easier for someone to buy a gun and put it to their head than it is to diagnose the illness within it, but I only have two minutes. And if there was time, I'd tell you that millions of young people and queer people and poor people and people of color are asking, what do we do with all this anger, all this fear, this disappointment and frustration, this mad that we feel? But alas, I only have one minute. And with it, this last minute of our conversation, I'd tell you that though all may seem lost, that there is a generation of dreamers and lovers and defenders and builders bubbling, bubbling, bubbling beneath the rubble. And beneath your feet, you may feel a collective quaking, tremors of a sleeping giant awakening, emanating from fault lines at the Arizona-Mexico border, and Raleigh, and in Austin, and in Cleveland, Ohio, and Chicago, Illinois, and even Tallahassee, Florida. And we've come here from every crack, crease, and crevice of our country to our capital to say that for all those whose cares have been our concern, we're ready. To say that anybody that believes will be co-opted Oh, we will not be bought and we're ready. And for those that doubt our energy and our resolve and our discipline, we're ready. For those that believe that future fingers may fail the torch, fear not, we're ready. For all... We're going to pause it there. What do you know about the Dream Defenders? Group of young African-American and Latino activists based in Florida who, by the way, have been in the governor's office in the State House in Florida since Trayvon, since the end of the Zimmerman trial, pushing for a change of legislation around stand your law, um, laws, stand your ground laws, right? An organization that began in the shadows of the Trayvon Martin case. And what's important about the video that you just saw is that it speaks to where this generation of youth activists are. Agnew and Dream Defenders as example of what Kathy Cohen at the University of Chicago and Joseph Kahn at Mills College refer to as participatory politics, which is a riff on Henry Jenkins' call for what he calls participatory culture. And what that means is participatory, participatory culture and politics are acts that are interactive and per Jenkins, shareable and spreadable, right? This is a generation that didn't need to have to be at the march because they could use their own technology to create their own march, right? And Jenkins makes this point, you know, we all understand about the value of a shareable culture. We share links all the time. He uses the term spreadable as if we were talking about peanut butter and talking about getting a coverage on something. So that's what he means by spreadable in this case. So acts that are interactive, shareable, and per Jenkins, spreadable. Two, activities that are peer-based. Three, not guided by deference to elites or formal institutions, including media outlets. Four, meant to, uh, meant to address issues of public concern. Five, 
not solely defined by forms of social media and digital technology, right? And since social media allows youth to access and mobilize large networks to amplify issues of concern to them, a digital counterpublic, if you will. And so if you look at this particular generation of activists, we can go back to 2005 and find when this moment comes together. What do you know about 2005? George Bush had just won his second term. George Bush had just won, won his second term? Many of us were not right. The year before? <laughs> well, what was the defining story of 2005? Katrina. Hurricane Katrina. All right. But there's another story that occurred earlier in 2005, February 2005, in fact. It's actually intric intricately connected to Katrina. It was the launching of YouTube. And so literally days after Hurricane Katrina and Kanye's inarticulate expression of how he felt about George Bush's racial politics. I thought it was articulate. <laughs> George got this Bush video. doesn't care about black people. Fuck us up round here. Government acting like it's bad luck down here. All I know is that you better bring some trucks round here. Wonder why I got my middle finger up round here. People lives on the line, you decline in the hell. Since you taking so much time, we survive in ourselves. Just me and my pets and my kids and my spouse. Trapped in my own house looking for a way out. Tell them that we need to get out of here. Five days in this motherfucking attic. Can't use the cell phone, I keep getting static. Dying cause they lie instead of telling us the truth. Other day the helicopters got my neighbors off the roof. Screw cause they said they're coming back for us too. That was three days ago. I don't see no rescue. See a man's gotta do what a man's gotta do. Since God made the path and I'm trying to walk through. What? Swam to the store trying to look for food. Corner stores kind of flooded so I broke my way through. I got what I could but before I got through the news said police shot a black man trying In the larger context is, of course, this was a game changer, right? Suddenly there was a technology that allowed young folks to cut through and present their own narratives outside of official media depictions of what happened. And it was so uniquely a part of this generation because so much of it was about sharing culture. Right? So the idea that you're using existing footage within this context, you take a very popular number one pop song by Kanye West and repurpose it right, for your own political reasons within this context. This is 2005. Two years later, what animates that generation is Gina 6. And what you have are young folks who did not see a way into official movement politics, right? And, and again, what do we even define as what the official movement politics might have been in 2007? Who have identified issues that are close to them that they can embrace and find a way to do activism around. What's so critical about the Gina 6 is that it's one of the clear-cut examples, particularly in the 21st century, of how it was young people's activism that actually brought the traditional civil rights leadership on board. Before Michael Bay's did, yeah. right, who at the time was hosting a national radio show, no longer on the air, right, before Michael Bay's then kind of tapped into this, there was very little national coverage of what was happening in Gina 6, even though young folks were already down there organizing around it, right? And it wasn't until there was an organi organizational structure set up by these young folks that the traditional old guard, the Jesse Jacksons, the Al Sharps, and those kind of folks kind of stepped into the scene. And this next example is not my favorite example. So let me just say that I don't think people were necessarily mesmerized by the politics of the man, and clearly aren't mesmerized by the politics of the man in 2013. But what the Obama campaign did in 2008 
was actually introduce them to how you strategize and organize using social media. So even folks who might at this point in time reject his, pub, his politics as being too far to the center or to the right, learn viable lessons about how you organize and reach people by the infrastructure that the Obama campaign created. We go forward to 2010. And what I'm seeing, what I'm trying to show you some signature moments in how this generation became politicized and began to think about what activism would look like for their generation. So these are a bunch of students at LSU uh, who went down after the Haitian earthquake to, of course, help rebuild the country. Right? And again, there's so many narratives, whether at Duke or HBCUs or students who gave up their spring breaks and summer vacations to be able to go down to Haiti, right? And again, the, the narrative that we hear over and over again about the generation is that they're apolitical, right? They're not engaged, they're not involved, right? But in terms, but they're actually political and engaged on their own terms. And then for me, what was really the critical moment in all of this, because it's a unique situation, was Troy Davis. Troy Davis, who was executed by the state of Georgia in September of 2011, um, and, and what I'd like to define as the first victory for this generation, because it was, in fact, the activism of this generation that earned Troy Davis a stay of execution for a few hours. Only a few hours, right? But it was the thing that convinced young folks that if they actually pushed, they could have some victory. One of the people I want to bring into this conversation around Troy Davis is this guy here. This is Troy Anthony Davis. I've been sitting on George's death row for a crime I could not commit. I would never take another human being's life. And this killer still out there. My family's been mourning. The victim's family's been mourning. And the truth is still locked in. Because I didn't get justice. Tells the court system employ racists. Then why are so many black boys in cages? Why shouldn't I be paranoid of hatred? Just look at the curious case of Troy Davis. Let's travel on down to Savannah. In the state of Georgia, just south of Atlanta. Like a bandana, hunger ancestors didn't pose for the cameras. A white police officer was shot and killed. All for an argument, he tried to stop and heal. But here's where the black is real. The main suspect blamed Troy, went to the cops and squealed. And with no physical evidence or weapon, Troy was arrested for a 187. He said he was an innocent man when he was questioned. But they said he did it, who needs a damn confession? They just need a witness, they can press the crime. Tell him with the sale, they'll arrest the guy. Then put him on the stand and make him testify. Swear to God to tell the truth and do their best to lie. And they did, so Troy was found guilty. Sent the death row by a scheme so filthy. Even though his innocence is true, we pray they don't reminisce over you, my God. Almost all of the prosecution's star witnesses have changed their stories. Some say police pressured them to say Troy Davis did. Daryl Collins, one of the prosecution witnesses, who signed a police statement implicating Troy Davis. And I told them over and over that this is, I didn't see this happen. They put what they wanted to put in that statement. But the truth always comes to light, and Troy Davis didn't give up the fight. He kept filing the bill until it was revealed. The state of Georgia wants an innocent man killed. That's why I rule who want him out. Cause it's just too much doubt And witness after witness came forward And admitted the only reason they did it Is cause police insisted So wicked, so vicious Jusiri X, for lack of a better way to describe him Really is the hip hop star of the broadband era He became relevant to a national audience Because he understood the power of broadband And YouTube in particular And began to create music specifically geared Towards circulation within that medium. So what he has done throughout his career is to make music and music videos to respond to particular crises. So he was one of the first hip hop artists to talk about Gina Six, right? He's on board with Troy Davis, right? Of course, obviously all over Trayvon Martin, but he's also making videos in support of the state workers in Madison, Wisconsin, right? Understanding the value of a hip hop worldview, because he is hip hop generation, being interconnected with white working class municipal workers, right? And so it's a totally different model, right? Because you'll never hear Jasiri X on the radio, right? But you can download his videos, download his music. He publishes full, all of his lyrics, right? And, and he's an interesting backstory because he, until fairly recently, was like the head minister of the nation of Islam, 
in the city of Pittsburgh. Though if you were to see in his activism and his politics, there's some interesting kind of disconnect there. Yeah. Right? Because this is an artist who has also been very vocal about talking about homophobia and other kinds of issues that we didn't, ne didn't necessarily think about as being traditionally black nationalists, or at least black nation, nation of Islam issues. And I would argue that when we see the activism that explodes a year later around Trayvon Martin, it was because of the digital infrastructure that was set up six months earlier around Troy Davis. And one of the things that Khan and Cohen talk about is that this participatory politics generally come from folks who de develop a skill set around digital technology, gaming, social media, and a range of other things. Right? There, there's this great story, this great organization of, of Harry Potter folks, right? That numbers in the hundreds of thousands, right? That are you know this kind of online group of folks who are into Harry Potter. Right, who've been able to reach out and do progressive political things simply because they have this number of folks who are together, they are peers, and they can push their peers to do progressive politics. And so what we saw with the kind of infrastructure that was created around Troy Davis is that suddenly there's this infrastructure that was set up around digital media that explodes. So we see examples, as this is Union Square in New York City, of the Hoodie March from March of 2012. Old white guy, also at Union Square. They never stop and frisk old white guys like me, right? So these are multi-issue dynamics, right? So yes, we're talking about Trayvon Martin and stay on your ground, but in New York City, what does that look like? What it looks like stop and frisk. And even high-profile celebrities, like our friends here in the Miami Heat, uh, minus the one white guy who was having surgery that day. <laughs> And so I say all of this to say is that we have a generation of folks who have understood the power of the technology, and for them, trying to address issues of racial inequality are going to look very different than the previous generation. And it's not to say that the old civil rights generation themselves did not take advantage of cutting edge technology. The mimeomagraph machine in 1959, right, was cutting edge technology, right? It was a way for you to mass produce flyers to get people out to the meeting, right? You know, I'll go back and argue that, you know, slave songs were the first form of Twitter, right? They were a form of social media, how people communicated with each other in certain kinds of ways, right? So I'll sit and we'll pass it on to one. Thank you. Could, is there any way to turn up the light a little bit? I'm blind as bad. Oh, that's okay, I'll do. Um, I'll do um, ad lib performance. When, when my son was 15 years old, he recorded this message on our answering machine. If you believe in the narrative construction of reality, leave a message for Wanima. If you, <laughs> if you believe in the social construction of reality, leave a message for Raphael. If you don't give a damn about reality, leave a message for Jaffe. I'm starting with two epigraphs. <laughs> The first language is from Oliver Cox, magisterial 1948 study, class, caste, and race. Quote, we cannot defeat race prejudice by proving that it is wrong. The reason for this is that race prejudice is only a symptom of a materialistic social fact. The white man's ideas about his racial superiority are rooted deeply in the social system and can be corrected only by changing the system itself, end quote. And then a second piece of language. If Africa, quote, if Africa can be understood to be underpolluted, then certainly we can think about the lack of attention to the pathologies of the rich overclass as a field of under scrutiny, end quote. This language is excerpted from Basil Nosferatu's groundbreaking study, Clint Eastwood's Baby Mamas. 50 Years of the Sociopathology and Familial Aesthetics of Rich White Men, 1960 to 2010. Okay, I made up that second apograph. And, <laughs> and the book title, and the author, and you can ask me about it later. 
But it is Cox's exhortation that we have to change the system itself, and he made it clear in his work that he was talking about capitalism and its foundation for a social hierarchy that I most want us to keep in mind, yet at the same time, I do not want to sever racism's connection to that materiality. I'm interested here in thinking about racism as ideology, as a species of common sense that shares with many other instances of common sense qualities of extreme resilience, rhetorical efficiency, and strong resistance to informed analyses, elaborated arguments, and critiques of its own interpretive prowess. Racism as common sense obfuscates the viciousness of our social system. It draws our attention away from structures of general inequality. It necessarily draws our attention away from the structural work of capitalism as it produces class harm, class harm that is then falsely understood to be individual insufficiency and or racial group pathology. It allows material reality to be shunted to the background by foregrounding continual stories of black individual and group failure black pathology and black loss compared to the myths of US individual heroism and myths of individual self-empowerment among those who are unmarked. Under this view, individual excellence is the domain of the dominant political ethnicity, or in other and shorter words, the myths understood to be white. It plays its part in material effects <clears throat> in material effects by encouraging public discussion to make sense of the world in ways that do not depend for their efficacy on accuracy, as Oliver Cox was pointing out in the first epigraph. Racism depends instead on its simplicity as explanatory narrative and a means of congealing aesthetic and affective responses to the material world, or what I've called the affective career of race. I teach critical interpretation of social texts. So what I'm talking about today comes out of a course I'm teaching right now on prison, the US, and the carceral imagination, and one that I taught to first year students in the spring. Doing that course requires that I put work into demystifying the relations that suture together our consent not just to being governed, but our consent to having that governance understood in the lingua franca of quote, what is natural, what is most apparent to the meanest intelligence, what we take for granted, end quote. In other words, ideology at the level of the everyday. It means that I address the familiar, the ordinary, in order to make sense of racism as a narrative that organizes selective attention and scrutiny, or narrative as a way to make you unsee, to think about what Angel was talking about, narrative as a way to make you unsee, in fact, what you do see. Racism as a social narrative is a kind of everyday imaginative and ugly commons. It belongs, although unevenly so, to the whole of a social order. It is an account about which everyone feels free to hold opinions, a set of accounts that people can latch onto at the drop of a hat. It has a powerful simplifying effect. It produces and reinforces a massive set of assumptions that have circulated for a few hundred years. But what might be especially useful to keep in mind in this historical conjuncture as we consider the viciousness and the successfulness of that narrative is that the narrative of black pathology with regard to poverty and unemployment is an increasingly generalized address to the larger social order. One could, for example, exhaust and nauseate oneself reading articles about Republican elected officials demeaning the unemployed, the poor, working or not, the people dependent upon food stamps, et cetera, et cetera, as, quote, lazy, shiftless, unwilling to bestir themselves in order to better their conditions, end quote. You've all heard or read this. The pervasiveness of immiseration generally spreading is now providing new rhetorical ground for extending old and very familiar tropes and stereotypes, but with new subjects in mind. In fact, one could call it, and I frequently do, the negroidization of the general US less well-off population. Shared and varied demographic misery might itself prove a new testing ground for social control via rhetorical gerrymandering, a kind of proof that racism can be assigned situationally without the actual presence either of the word race or the skin color. 
It is truly a customizable application. I'm surprised that some smartphones haven't already been equipped with an app for it. <laughs> Perhaps one of the narrative's most common appearances is connected to public discussions of black poverty and crime. In those moments, the unbridled democracy of anti-intellectual ignorance is flagrantly on display. Think about the continual replaying of this kind of scene. A local news anchor cuts from discussion of some form or instance of crime where the offender is black American or some form or instance of poverty, unemployment, and or the need for social services, topics that are always readily at hand, and decides to listen to the gamut of confident assertions about what needs to be done so that the problems of the hood or the ghetto, the stand-in for black people more generally speaking, are addressed. The woman or man with a microphone confidently ma marches up to a person on the street and queries, do you think that racism is still a problem? And some commonsensical form of racism is promptly and confidently rearticulated by that person on the street. I'm going to end this with a particularly insidious example that, of course, comes out of the two prison courses. And that's the phrase black on black violence or black on black crime. That phrase is a constant presence on the agenda of many black organizers and activists. And it is also deployed in order to interrupt criticism of police violence against black people, criticism of disparate sentencing, criticism of mass incarceration, and criticism of vigilante violence against members of the group. And yes, I'm talking about the murder of Trayvon Martin. I see in mass circulation, print, media, online, and real life, how that phrase works rhetorically to interrupt conversation. And I know as well that both black Americans and non-black Americans alike trade in the currency of this phrase, often out of concern for what happens in black communities and sometimes out of a reflexive scolding gesture or what I refer to as the Bill Cosby genre of public thought. For me, the why of the gesture isn't as important as what the gesture does, regardless of who's speaking the phrase. It's another means by which purported black American singularity is moved into rhetorical position to further cement our pathology. It introduces inadequate generalizations instead of the relationships, the complex connections that require considerable elaboration in order for us to make sense of crime, of policing, and of juridical processes. What happens within the ambit of this phrase and its popularity? To see how it works, compare it to a different, a non-existent, a counterfactual category, quote, white on white violence or white on white crime. How many of you have ever seen instances of this category in common parlance? Crickets. <laughs> what exactly would be an example of white on white crime? Bernie Madoff, Enron, the Macy Cole Company, Rich white kids in gated communities and mansions who put homemade bombs in their neighbor's mailboxes? Would that be rich white kid on rich white neighbor crime? And what about domestic violence among white Americans? Is that white spouse on white spouse violence? In the moment of prohibition and the quite horrific rate of organized crime violence then, especially among white ethnic crime groups, did we speak of white on white violence? In the common social parlance of reputable newspapers, for example, is organized crime violence described in terms of ethnic categories, Italian on Italian murders? Do we have a category of white meth dealers on white meth <laughs> dealer violence for meth related killers? <laughs> or white cocaine dealer on white cocaine dealer violence? We don't have those things because such categories would work to misdirect our attention away from making social sense. Black on black violence is racism dressed up in common sense narrative understanding. It makes us stupid and produces at the same time more black American singular pathology understandings. So Tim. I'm a, I'm a historian. I believe in the narrative structure of reality. So I'll be leaving one name of messages the, uh, <laughs> rather than her children. Um, 
North Carolina has this deep history of black radical democracy and interracial politics. It's an unusual uh, history. Abraham Galloway and Bishop J.W. Hood and Sam, who are both uh, African American freedom fighters, uh, combined with Samuel Ashley, a white Congregationalist minister, and found the first public schools in the United States here. Wrote the North Carolina Constitution under which we still uh, operate. Now, um, so we also had a, a white populist tradition, which was powerful. People forget, actually, L.L. Polk died on the way to accept the presidential nomination of the, of the Populist Party of, came from North Carolina. And uh, we had, at the turn of the, cent of the 20th century, uh, we had an interracial coalition that took state power. Both U.S. Senate seats, the governor's uh, mansion, took uh, all, every statewide election. They never got beaten at the polls, not once. White conservatives always hated public education. They considered it a radical measure uh, and, and to take tax money and educate poor children just offended them no end, always has. And they were always scheming to try to get the money uh, funneled back to them somehow, if not do away with the whole proposition altogether. Now, um, in 1898, we had a, the white conservatives overthrew the state government, this interracial, imperfect, uh, in critically important experiment in interracial democracy that could have changed the history of the South and indeed, the, therefore, the country and therefore the world, which is how it always operates, if you ask me. I think this is the place uh, where we hammer such things out. But... Um, so they, and then they nailed in one party rule and a racial caste system, uh, white domination. And then we have an interesting thing happen. Governor Acock gets this crazy place, uh, but uh, the conservative candidate for governor, uh, after they seized power in a bloody revolution and stealing the election through fraud and mass murder and terror and intimidation and every other uh, means you can think of, he then uh, becomes a paternalist. And so white liberalism in this state is a mixture of that populism that was strong and then this ACOC paternalism that says to whoever is talking to, it always says half a loaf is better than a kick in the head, right? Nice half loaf, kick in the head. That, you know, that may be politics, but that's how it works here anyway. The, uh, so we have this unique black radical uh, humanism. We have the, with a, that's powered by a distinctive Afro-Christianity. Uh, and then we have a white dominion that's expressed through paternalism and violence, two sides of the same coin, and tempered with this populism and the always dangerous possibility that black and white people will get together in the same coalition. Now in 2005, when, we, when YouTube arrived and Katrina, uh, something else was going on, which was uh, Reverend William J. Barber II uh, was, became the first person in the history of the state to overturn a seated, seated NAACP president. Got up out of a wheelchair he was supposed to be in for the rest of his life and hobbled up from one end of the state to the other in, in great pain, physical pain, and, and won the NAACP presidency. In 2007, put together the HK on J coalition, statewide progressive coalition, and uh, he talked of Ezekiel, who, who uh, the Lord called to, to call the winds from the four corners of the earth across the valley of the dry bones, the thousands, the many thousands gone, and up would rise an army of liberation. He, he uh, put this in place, built the second largest NAACP in the United States, uh, the one that changed the voting laws uh, in, in collaboration with this coalition and changed, got on-site same-day voter registration, got early voting, Sunday voting. We got, you know, Minnesota-style voting laws here in the South. Better, really. The, some, arguably the best voting laws in the country. This enabled Obama to win North Carolina in 2008, 
uh, with uh, powered by this coalition. The uh, in in uh, 2010 we were sleep at the switch, <laughs> and uh, of course everybody else was. So it's, it must be simpler. It must be more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. But we got a Tea Party legislature who's ended up being quite helpful, actually. So I'm not sure it was a total failure. It was if it if it was a success, though, it was accidental because we certainly didn't mean to elect a legislature full of Fruit Loops, but we sure did. Um, so, but a good thing happened uh, in, in 2012, though Obama did not win North Carolina, that the Amendment 1, the anti-gay marriage amendment, was on the ballot in the primary. Now, it got, we got clobbered, but something happened, which was this historic alliance between the NAACP and Equality North Carolina and the Human Rights Campaign and Song Southerners on New Ground that between the politically organized LGBT community and the NAACP. You know, the, everybody's anti image of the anti gay person is a black preacher. Well, we had black preachers going all across this state night after night after night after night uh, to, talking at black churches. And uh, if white people had not been allowed to vote, which I'm not suggesting, mind you, although I would not be all that upset. But <laughs> if white people had not been allowed to vote, on, on fairness, no, that would be a bad idea. It's just that the outcome I would probably like. The, uh, if white people had not been allowed to vote, that amendment would have gone down. And the place they wanted especially was A, a in the partisan you know, Republican suburbs, but B, out in the western part of the North Carolina where there's a small number of votes, but if you, you know, 15,000 votes in a county, it's not very many votes if you split them 53, 47, like it, everywhere else. But if you win them 82 to 18, it's a lot of votes. So that's where we lost. Right now what's happened is uh, this coalition, which has been shaped by a lot of, uh, of the things that have been mentioned, uh, Troy Davis and Tra Trayvon Martin cases, uh, young people teaching us how to do social media. Um, we've sort of combined the spirit of the black church. I think we, we've got an un, largely unchurched white left. We've got the, the vision of the black church in slavery. I mean, the historic black church, not the one that, not the, you know, uh, gospel of progress black, the black church, but, but the old black church that was, that was founded in the tobacco barns and down by the river in the middle of the, the illegal black church, you know. Liberation. That, yeah, the liberation black church. That language uh, has come together and they, they, that coal, this coalition has developed a cultural style that we're still kind of trying to uh, hammer out exactly, but a lot of the, the, the white progressives have never, you know, sort of put their finger in that particular light socket before. And so they're having this spiritual experience that they are not, did not come here for, right? And then we've got, and then, you, you know, the old NAACP rank and file has to look around and notice that there are sure a whole lot of gay people here. And there's just no way around it. We, 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 it was easier when we just had the lesbians. We could pretend. But the gay men in our crowd are usually pretty, anyway, they dress better. They are... Uh, they, they're looking around going, Where, who are all these white people? And then some of them, oh, you know. But it was like, it's okay. It's okay. We're working out, we've got, we're working out a kind of language of love and hope and a kind of community. And with this, uh, Reverend Barber launched this Moral Monday business. I wanted to close by just telling you uh, one story, which is uh, I called Reverend Barber on Friday night, a couple of, I don't know, it's been almost a month ago now. Time flies. Mm -hmm. Time flies when you're overthrowing the government. Um, the, uh, <laughs> check the governor's polls lately. 35, remember invincible governor? Couldn't be beaten. Nobody wanted any of that. Got to spend more time with my family. So said the, uh, all, every good candidate we had. Um, now everybody wants a, wants a shot at him because he's dead in the water. And that, that we're going to hose out that legislature. Gerrymander or don't gerrymander, get ready. Because here we come. A case in point, I, when I called Reverend Barber, I said, what you doing? You know, I, knew we, I knew we were going to see each other on Monday. 
in Asheville uh, for Moral Monday in the Mountains. And then uh, I said, what you doing Sunday night? He said, what do you want me to do? And I said, no, I want you to go with me to Mitchell County. He said, I knew, I knew you were going to get me killed. <laughs> I've known that. <laughs> but Mitchell County is 99 point something percent white. They ran all the black people out of Mitchell County in 1923 at gunpoint. Mm -hmm. There is one black family in Mitchell County. Um, Mitchell County is 11% Democrat. 1-1, one, 11% one, Democrat. Just our crowd. Uh, we had a church full, uh, packed, all the wall space taken up, people all the way down the hall out in the vestibule standing, uh, at least a half a dozen standing ovations. Uh, Reverend Barber left there with every vote in that room. They tried to talk Reverend Barber into going across the church parking lot where to the home of Ralph Heiss, North Carolina Senator Ralph Heiss, their senator, and knocking on the door with this crowd behind him and asking him why he was voting against public education. There's a re revolt going on in the mountains. They're organizing an NAACP chapter in Mitchell County. I'm, I kid you not. <laughs> this is happening. Okay, and another, there are actually about four coming together. Uh, Boone is just about to blow because of this college student, because of the stuff they're doing around voting. So, this brings together, it's a, you know, people compare this to what's going on to Wisconsin. It's not much like it in a certain way. Uh, we are uh, getting white working people, but not, in Wisconsin, you're talking about unions. We don't, we're a little short on unions. <laughs> But uh, what, we've, what we've got is a kind of uh, recapture of, a, of the spiritual. And really, when it comes right down to it, you can get there any way you want to through reason. You know, but we're talking about a social ethos grounded in love. You can get there through Islam, through Judaism, through Buddhism, through <laughs> Christianity, or through reason. There are lots of through, you can get there through... Uh, Karl Marx, you can get there a lot of different ways. You know, feminism is love. You know, that's, I mean, when you get right down to it, it's, you know, seeing other people as a human being, you know, just like yourself. That's, 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 that's a social ethos grounded in love. We find that we have more that we agree on than we disagree on, and that we don't have to agree on everything. We, this legislature's been wonderfully helpful, wouldn't you say? Because <laughs> they give us many things that we agree on. Um, so, um, it's interesting to see what's going to happen. I think it's got serious uh, national implications because, uh, A, I mean, it is replicable. You know, it's not, uh, we don't, it's not magic. And you, we, you, the churches are places where that belong to the people. They're not owned by corporations, you know, and, and, uh, it's just, it's, that's not the only place where, so you have pr progressives who have networks everywhere, but are sometimes beleaguered and beaten down. And then you have people of color, you have the LGBT community, you have all of those things pulled together. Um, I don't know what's gonna happen, except I know that we're gonna stomp the governor in 2016 if he lasts in office that long, and, and get us a new legislature, and things are gonna be different around here. And I'm so excited to just be able to see it. I don't know, I can't, I don't have a crystal ball or I'd roll it out. <laughs> so, talk back. Yeah. Um, so, I struggle with the charge that I'm the post hip hop generation, but I respect that. Um, my question is in response to the, the conversation about the age of technology that we're in. And so on Twitter, for example, every day there's a new issue that people are kind of tackling, grappling with. Uh, the folks at the Root the other day tweeted, what are you reading about black people today? <laughs> and it's just like, every day it's something that people are kind of attacking. So I wonder how do we sustain a conversation, a real dialogue, and um, make it productive instead of just like this 
you know, racial, uh, digital, like, you know, attack on, you know, whatever issue that we kind of come up with. And then my second question is, how do you manage the scholar activist role, particularly in this age of um, technology where we have these platforms like Twitter or Tumblr or anything without ostracizing ourselves from the very institutions and communities that we want to access um, and that the people we want, the white people that we want to hear us, you know, so how do we kind of like manage that presence online where these real conversations are happening? I, I'll answer the first question and then open it up to the rest for the second part. You know, one of the things that's interesting about the Khan and Cohen study is that, you know, they identified that folks who are really engaged in the technology are five times more likely to participate in what they call participatory politics, but actually four times as likely to participate in traditional political activity. And so what the technology really is about is how do you, it's offered new tools for folks who would have been engaged already and allows a context to actually bring folks who would not have been engaged into the process. You know, it's a new technology, right? I always remind folks the early days of VHS, record, uh, VHS recorders and VHS tapes. And all of us can remember the value of those. How many baby showers, weddings, you know, yeah. little Johnny digging up his nose with oatmeal moments that, you know, we were able to capture 30 years ago on a VHS. But what was the industry that exploded because of VHS tapes? Pornography, right? Because suddenly you didn't have to be the dude in the raincoat, you know, going to 42nd Street. I mean, 42nd Street was literally regentrified, <laughs> right, two, two years later because of the VHS. <laughs> and so you, you're always going to have these other things that emerge with these new technologies, right, including random conversations, very often driven by corporate media entities who are trying to bring traffic to their sites, <laughs> right? So The Root's a good example, and, and, and you know, it's, it's a dicey example because, you know, I'm going to be writing for them, <laughs> right? And, and, you know, there's some good people up there, but, you know, they ran a piece a couple of weeks ago about Jamie Foxx calling out Jay-Z, you know, at the March on Washington, and then you go listen to Jamie Foxx's comments, and it's like, what the hell was that? Right? It didn't have anything to do, and we, you know magazines do that all the time, but what we see now, there are these kind of controversies that are being driven by corporate media. Right? That's all about bringing traffic to their site. Some of them legitimate, some of them not. Um, and we just have to get better in terms of discerning what kind of issues are important. And, and the key thing is that you know, once you see there's an organizational structure set up, other than complaining, Right, it, those are the kinds of things that you then find important to contribute to. So when you think about Juror B39, right, you know, where folks would have been real pissed off about her showing up on television, right, but organization took place and three hours later she didn't have a book deal anymore. Yeah. Can I add to that? Mm. Because I was thinking when you were talking that as someone really late to social media, I mean, really, someone you had know, to hold the gun. You know, that's gun. an understatement. Thank Thank you. You. <laughs> they had to hold the gun to me, and I'm on Twitter now, and I'm not sure I recognize myself. But one of the things that I found that's fascinating about it is one sustains a dialogue not necessarily in one place. And you can sometimes see the dialogue moving in real time. Mm -hmm. And that itself has an educational aspect. I know so much more than I did before, you know, because I'm actually following things. Of course, I'm also more distracted, but then I was almost 100% distracted before that. But the second thing is that there are unintended consequences for good and ill. And that's regardless of any technology. Mark was gracious enough to talk about ditto flyers, which I know predates his time, right? Mm -hmm. But I was born before salt. And I remember <laughs> ditto flyers and their work in political activism. But I also know that the Avon ladies made the greatest use of ditto flyers, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's not like I bear some special animus to Avon ladies, but I'm anti-capitalism. <laughs> so I wasn't charmed by that. Does that make sense? And this, the second question when you were asking, managing the scholar activist role and what it does with regard to our institutions. It's always situational. When I'm addressing a group of people who want to make an argument for charter schools, then I am firmly on the side of public education. And I'm firmly on the side of opening up the university system to everyone. 
On the other hand, I also recognize that right now, the university system is not open to everyone. So part of the work I do in and out of the classroom is talking about the university from a critical point of view as the bottleneck that makes sure that class mobility is restricted. Yeah. And I live with the contradictions of that. Well, let me just make a couple points on sure. that. Uh, I don't do social media. Uh, I don't do Twitter. I don't do twerping. I don't do twerping. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I just got introduced last month to uh, the flip cell phone. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> that, uh, uh, and I'm from the old era, and I, I admit it. You know, I, I feel that I've been blessed. You know, uh, I, I've not been damaged uh, by that. So I've had a whole list of, of experience. Uh, and one of the things that, that I've learned over the years is that every generation has its own medium mm -hmm. of communication. And they change, the technology changes. Uh, and it's not the medium of communication that's critical. What's critical is the message. What, what the, because what we're looking for is the development of a movement and not a dialogue. Uh, a dialogue is important in helping people to understand what the movement ought to be and where the movement ought to be going, but merely engaging in the dialogue doesn't move us toward the political realities that uh, we want to uh, that we want to focus on. Amen. So it's not the medium; it's, it's 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 the message, and the critical part is understanding what is the message and what is the history of the message and what are the possibilities. Tim, Tim talks about, and, and I didn't want to go back to ancient history, uh, 1865, 1870, 1880, when you had this interracial cooperation in uh, North Carolina where you had African Americans who helped to develop the North Carolina Constitution that is in place uh, right, right, right now. That, that's important history for people to know. Uh, otherwise, they think that the Constitution is a relic of days gone bad, uh, when all we have to do is go back and understand the genius of what it was that the people were, and, 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 and that's a part of the message, because that can lead us to what is it that we ought to be trying to focus on today. And I think that, that, that Tim makes this motion about this notion of coalitions. How do we develop coalition that reaches out across our own individual interests to deal with those political realities that other people have where they have been dispossessed and helping them to understand how they've been disenfranchised and how we can join together as a part of the movement and carrying this message so that people understand better and not we use the medium as tools, and, and, and that's because next week it's going to be something else, you know, and, and that's why stock market's going up and down. You know, every time they invent something, every, what, every other five weeks, <laughs> it's something new. What you've got now is out of, out of date, you know, but it's, if we have a movement with a message that everybody is moving toward, then the medium isn't critical because you're reaching a generation uh, with the medium that you're using. But there's another media uh, 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 community that I'm reaching as I walk into the church and use that old time religion methodology. And when I go into the bars and the clubs and other places that I have contact with, carrying this message as a part of the, uh, that movement. because I'm wondering, and this is a question for you, Dr. Jordan, um, Joyner, Tim, and anybody else who wants to address it. I'm wondering specifically about Moral Mondays and what the limits are um, for religious appeals. Um, I'm thinking, you know, we, someone told me recently that the only way to organize in the South and in North Carolina is the church. 
I actually think that's a very limiting view. Um, I'm, I believe in the history of this charismatic social justice gospel that comes from the black church, but I am also black and I am unchurched. Um, and so I'm wondering about what are the other ways you can mobilize people because it's much more compelling to me to think about histories of black pacifism or black armed self-defense or all these other messages. And I realize I may not be the average person, but at the same time, I'm wondering about where the movement can grow in terms of its message that does not have to reference Ezekiel and Isaiah. Well, you know, Ezekiel, I mean, first of all, to dispel Ezekiel. Is, see, that, that's, you know, that's, that's higher intellectual. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, the, 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 the church isn't the movement. The, the church is merely one medium. You know, one place that you meet and bring people uh, together. But what, what I find is that they are excellent examples of movement in the scriptures. And you can bring those and make those live to look at today's problem. Moral Monday isn't a religious movement. You know, there are, there are probably as many unchurched people in moral, um, associated with Moral Monday as, as anywhere. Reverend Barber is very church. Well, in fact, a lot of the church is unchurched. Uh, <laughs> can you speak that though? Because um, I know, I mean, I know there's a protester who holds up um, atheist or agnostic, and you know, still here. But you know, I've heard from people that that they consider that a very courageous choice because so much of the the language is about the Christian or the the person of faith yeah. commitment and indeed imperative to right. love people. And and, and and that's the language that you hear. Uh, but it's broader than that. Again, it goes back to the message. And if you listen to the message, you, 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 you lose that. And the movement is driven by the message. And now the church, I mean, I'm, I'm, hey, I'm churched. You know, I mean, I, I, I go and I believe. Uh, but there are other people that I have to reach out to. I mean, Tim talked about the uh, uh, Proposition 1. You know, the, all over the country, the most anti-gay community was the black church. Yet in North Carolina, because of this message that was developed to talk about that, the black church in North Carolina didn't go that way. You know, black church changed in, uh, in, 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 in North Carolina. And that's a part of moving people from one place to another because then we're talking about political realities. And how do you move on a political front using where you are as, uh, as, as a method of helping people to understand where they need to go? And, you I, know, I, oh, go ahead. Andrew. I do want to interject. I mean, to me, it sounds like this discussion is about how to get uh, the choir more members. Because at the end of the day, you're just preaching to the choir. So saying, okay, how do we go into the church and get more people on board with this movement? And so now we're all on board. Okay, so now let's move. Uh, where's the other people who don't, where's her mom, right? She was raised in a community in which she wasn't exposed to a lot of black people, am I correct? And you, you, weren't, you didn't have that exposure. So if you didn't have that exposure, imagine your mother. How are you going to bring her mother into the dialogue? That's the key question. You bring everybody to the church. Okay, so now we're we here, we're mad, we're ready. Okay, what are we going to change? We ain't got no resources. We ain't got no wealth. What are we going to change? Okay, we're saying the right things. We got to get her. We got to go to her mother and say, let me see your eyes and see how you see the world. Okay, wow, look at the lens through which you're seeing the world. And now, now that I understand how you're seeing the world, I got to get you over here. How do I do that? And that's the language. We need to learn how to talk about race in a way that extends beyond preaching to the choir. I, I want to use some of Angel's own numbers and examples. <laughs> When we talk about political mobilization, right, and let's think of it outside of North Carolina and the South for a moment, but what I've always been struck with is that the, the performance of politics that come from black institutions and its continuous reproduction of the tropes of the black church and spiritual traditions and black church music and how that is a mode to just simply, if you're in New York City, right, that doesn't resonate for 
African nationals who are living in New York City. It doesn't resonate for the same thing for maybe not the earliest Caribbean immigrants, but those who've come the last 20 or 40 years, what kind of rhetoric and style of performance of politics do we develop that speaks to a broader audience that really doesn't limit it to folks who can trace their heritage back to someone who might have been in slavery, you know, 200 years ago? And, and, and the numbers suggest, particularly in our metropolises, you know, major urban cities, that black community doesn't look like it used to. When I go back to the Bronx where I grew up, and, and think about what my parents saw the last couple of years of their life, I know in some ways it was, they saw just as many black folks, but it was not the black community that they raised me in, right? Very deep, they could not communicate with the folks who were in the community at this part of time. And I'm wondering if there's a real disconnect in terms of our political organization that also speaks to that disconnect. What about, what about uh, how would it work in New York City mm -hmm. if we had 8,000 people in unison chanting a uh, Jewish uh, blessing of, of, of love. Because <laughs> that happened here in, in downtown Raleigh about three or four times. We get the, the rabbi came from Charlotte and taught every, we didn't know what we were saying because we were speaking Hebrew. But she told us what we were saying yeah. and we all said it together. We, mm -hmm. we had an imam do the same thing, although we, the, uh, we have fewer Muslims than we do Jews. <laughs> we have lots of Jews. Um, and I suspect we might in New York City. Mm. The, uh, also, I just want to say that, you know, I feel like you guys are talking in cartoons, you know, because what you're th you, we think is happening is not what's happening. And it's not confined. I, if, if our leftist brothers and sisters, <laughs> like, you know, me, for instance, but, I mean, I grew up in the church, so the language is very mm -hmm. familiar. And I had, I, when I was a atheist, communist, I had a translator in my head. I know when somebody's talking about love. You know, you talk about that. You, I mean, and I know when somebody's talking, you can talk about hate and love it, using left, the, you know, sectarian left language. I know hate and love when I run into it, right? And people understand uh, what you're talking about. You have to give them a little credit there. It is a big enough language. I, I, I'm, not saying that, I'm not saying that folks don't get it. I'm saying it doesn't draw people in the way the performance suggests that it's a... What, well, I'm, what I'm saying is the performance is tired. That's specifically yeah. what I'm saying. Well, how about, how about, have you gotten 10,000 people to the state capitol lately? I mean, mm -hmm. with, with whatever it is you're recommending? Mm -hmm. I, I would like to hear the alternative viewpoint. How about but, a million people on Twitter, though? But, Mark, Mark let me... Let me well, don't, 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 by, no, by the way, let me, let me yeah. say this, Irving, and, and this is something that was we, just we, tweeted. We, this is something that just tweeted. Irving Joyner is on Twitter. Irving Joyner is killing it right now. <laughs> Defending Ezekiel and the flip phone, <laughs> the black church is unchurched. Get this man a Twitter now. <laughs> Let me just make this, 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 this quick point. You know, but my, my, I'm from Brooklyn, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm from Brooklyn, you know, and I organize in Brooklyn. I organize in New York, you know, I, I, and I understand. We, Moral Monday is organized in North Carolina. I got you. And we okay. have to organize to right. our reality. And, and, I now, wait, think wait, it, and I actually think it worked because it wasn't tired. Yeah, well, but, you know, but when, if, if I'm organizing in New York, I'm not necessarily using the same model. The key isn't the model that I'm using. Yeah. Right. The key is what is the message and what is the goal? What's the politics that we're trying to develop? And you can fashion any model around the message. message. What you need I, I is the that. message to move it. What that's, I'm that's saying is that you tell that to the national leadership. Right, because I understand oh, it. You tailored, and I mean that's because <laughs> that's really what my critique is about. Right, when we oh. talk about the performance oh. of black politics from a national, what we saw in D.C. <laughs> two weeks ago, right, that was a tired performance of a certain kind of black political performance that just does simply not resonate okay. the way it did 50 years okay. ago. Really good. Okay, I I, yeah. I can see how you two can can make peace. Right now. But I, I want to go back to like stroking the fires of discord because I'm, there's something in what Tim said that I think is really useful to keep in mind. When we talk, we rhetorically necessarily reproduce categories as whole categories that in fact are incredibly fluid mm -hmm. and malleable on the ground. So a million hoodie march 
is right. made up of people who are brought together by social media, but also people who are not brought together by social media, but they are within the sound of social media by virtue of complicated mm -hmm. relationships, yes. some of which are church and some are unchurch. So if I think of myself, and I like to think of myself, as someone who is not only an atheist and a leftist, but an apostate, because my father was a minister, my mother a lifelong church woman, and every single other person in my family is churched. So I'm plowing a kind of lonely aesthetic most of the time in my family. On the other hand, I can feel and hear myself <laughs> hailed by other circumstances. Does that make sense? So it's like, well, when I'm hailed by those circumstances, am I being hailed as an as an atheist or as a Marxist or as someone who believes in reason or as someone who is capable of complicated love in response to these gatherings that do not include one million replications of myself. So. We're also, I feel like we're getting the, the, yeah. the love and church and social media yeah. on the end of some kind of binary seesaw yeah. and we're all over social media. Yeah. And film has been a big thing. We've got all these very good uh, filmmakers I, who Reverend, are doing... Reverend Barber's YouTube Ooh. site is... You need yeah. to check it out. His YouTube site is kind of hot. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, check the latest one. I mean, I mean, I, like I mean I, but, but that's why I mean that, you know, you employed strategies and Moral Mondays that, that took it beyond that, right? The, the importance of documenting it so that folks who couldn't be there would have access to it in terms of social media, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. yeah. Yeah, and they went first. You know, the first people arrested in this movement were students. And we went, come on. <laughs> you know, those of us who... If you understand... They act like it was us. People would say, oh, you know, that was when Reverend Barber and them went to got arrested. We were students went first. But if you understand the historical context of a liberation movement, the persons who were arrested in the 60s were 13 year old and for there's a documentary on young girls that they herded into a jail cell and Stokely Carmichael wasn't Stokely Carmichael or you know always the fiber and he was a student that jumped on top of you know some crates and said we're not doing this passive nonviolent I mean so the historical context is always the reinvention I call it of the river if you listen to the young man, Al, Al Jarizi, what was his name? Uh, Jaziria. That's Jaziria. I just know. I just know him by face. If you listen, and I listen to speech, he had the cadence of a young Martin Luther King. His case, so he was. You, that was the same cadence, the same the way his words fell. But I only have two seconds, and he repeated it. And that's that's a trope that's used in the church, that was used in the grape arbors. So you're talking about a conversation on race that may be on the other side of the river, but they weren't familiar with it. So it sounds new and unusual, and we talk about technology, but you know, it's the young folk. You know, John Lewis was 17 years old. Mm -hmm. 17 years old, when you, t when you read, if you really go back and read things like uh, Selma, that bridge, that march across that bridge. And what invigorated a lot of people in my generation with 30 years where I'm gonna kill Sandy, wherever he is, <laughs> for telling my time, was that we saw the water hoses on little girls who had at the time, if you were a little black girl and you had black, we call them plaits, yeah. you had plaits and you had big bows on the top of your head. And that's what meant you were dressed, whether it was church or not. And they turned water hoses on young girls and they bombed you know young people were dying mm -hmm. and you know it Every story that we hear, it's not about, you know, just the older generation, it's the younger generation also. And so to answer your question about how do you manage that, that's a, del you know, that's like walking on logs. How do you manage a racial, you know, presence and a consciousness with working in an institution that may not recognize your negritude or your Asian-ness or, you know, your, L you know, queerness or whatever, that, that's, a, that's a balance. You, you, that's like learning how to be married. Nobody can tell you that, okay? <laughs> I mean, you just have to, you have to get in that and work your way through it, and hopefully you'll get a good mentor. 
and a mentor will say, well, maybe you want to publish this paper here as opposed to here because it'll have more legitimacy. And, and it, you have to make, you have to, come, you have to meet yourself. We were talking about that earlier yes, in search yes, of myself. Yes. Yes. You have to meet yourself because there's going to be a place where hopefully where you say this far and no further, yeah. right? Yeah. This, this far, you know, I am who I am. And you have to come to terms with that. And that's, that's a, you know, that's a maturation process. Yeah. And for black women, it church, unchurched, yeah. Or not, mm -hmm. you, I mean, you, you know, you're just digging in some trenches, and sometimes you have to put on your boxing gloves. But get the big girl pan if you just got the boxing gloves, okay? <laughs> so to answer that question, I, I exactly. wanted to answer that question as well because I think it's really important. <laughs> My view is a little different. Um, I think that uh, uh, as a student, uh, pre-tenure, uh, <laughs> scholarship first. <laughs> scholarship first. Everyone at some point who you see in places that where you want to be in the academy, there was a stretch of time, 10, 15 years, where it was just straight, what I call ass to chair. In the dungeon, sweats, just working. Scholarship first. Because uh, the minute you go the other route, it becomes me search. It becomes, oh, therapy. And <laughs> now what happens is that um, uh, you can't have a committee that looks like us. And this is your committee. It ain't gonna work. See, we, you can't be validated by four Negroes, right? You gotta have, it's gotta be legitimized in some way. You know, it's real talk, right? It's gotta be legitimized in some way. And so what you have to realize is that there's a cost associated with activism early in your career. Mm -hmm. And the question is, is that a cost you're willing to pay? Because there will be a cost. For me, I say, don't pay that cost until after tenure. And see, I, my, I would take exception to that because I came to the academy <laughs> late, all right? And I earned my tenure in a cabbage field with a plantation master representing the person in court. So everybody has their different, you know, pathways. And when I came to scholarship, I was an old hen, right? So what was getting a paper accepted at Fordham? Because I had stared down a judge who literally wanted to put a 14-year-old boy in jail. So you, you, there's a pathway. So different people take different pathways. If you want to do straight scholarship in academia, then there's, there's that pathway. If you have another route where you really want activism, you take another pathway. I mean, it, that's what I meant about finding who you are. Um, I took a different pathway. That doesn't mean that it was less perilous or it didn't cost me, right? Yes, it did. I ended up working in New Hampshire black woman, New Hampshire, you can't even find <laughs> hair products. So, I mean, you know, the point is, there is no one way. I was an orange though, because- There is no one way. She, there's, a, there's an applied side to what she does. Lawyer, doctor, uh, if, you're, if you're a sociologist, if you're, if you're an economist, um, we don't have that applied avenue the same way, right? And so, of course, if I were in law and I see something, and I see a kid who's gonna be, then I'm, it's a different situation. As a sociologist, I don't deal with anything that dire, you know? But you know. But do you need uh, tenure I've, by the time you get it? That's what I was <laughs> saying. Most people who get tenure, they don't need it after they get it because they ain't doing nothing. <laughs> the, the thing is. You got to make sure you're still alive when you get tenure. <laughs> and the, the thing is, I, I think we have to take seriously the complexities of different sets of circumstances. I spent nine years as an assistant professor. Yes. Okay. On the other hand, I also did things. Right? And so I, I did what Brenda's describing. I thought about the life I wanted to have and the career I wanted to have, and I made some decisions. And I have no regrets about those decisions. And I'm especially interested in thinking about historical conjunctures because we're at a moment where tenure is vanishing. Okay? So if you are in a PhD program, you have already had to make peace with right. the possibility that you not only will not have tenure, you may not even have a tenure rank job as an assistant professor. Okay, now, we can say that we don't give up on tenure. This is not a call for us to give up on tenure, but it is a call to take seriously what's happening in your moment. 
Okay. Now, my moments were extraordinary in a lot of ways, but three years at Texas, six years at Princeton to be booted out without tenure was not pleasant. But I don't have any regrets about what I did, especially what I did when I was booted out of Princeton. <laughs> 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 Stacey and Nicole is going to hate me, but we're going to take one more question. Uh oh. If there is one. I have a question. It may be too broad, but we're talking about two kind of demographic shifts and changes in the way in which we understand race. And we have this precarious place of the multiracial community now. We have the addition of them on the census. We have, you know, the face of multiracial children as, you know, racial harmony, we have arrived, we are, you know, colorblind. I was interested in understanding kind of your take on the, not necessarily the addition of multiracial, because they've always been a part of our nation's racial landscape, but the, the discourse surrounding them, I guess, post-2000 census, how may we want to look at the multiracial community or talk about the multiracial community moving forward as anti-racists or individuals engaging in these types of racial discourse, because it can be obviously a, a tricky slope. Because on one hand, they're viewed sometimes as you know the racial utopia we have arrived. On the other hand, they're seen as a community that, in some respects, particularly those who are half black and something else, is kind of um, undermining all the civil rights work that has been done for communities of color. So. That may be too big of a question. Right. So let, let me wanna... let me respond by saying race is a social construct. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we know that. You know, cognitively, we know that. What is going on in America is we still want to cat categorize people. Oh, he's black, she's white, he's Asian, he's Hispanic, he's black Hispanic, you know, white Caribbean. And so the, the discussion even on multiracialness is a concession to the fact that we as humans have not accepted that we are humans with distinctions, but that race is not necessarily one that should make a difference. So I think that conversations about multiracial you know, children and people and, and, and that. I think those converse, conversations should begin with an acceptance. Wait a minute, we're talking about something that is really a misnomer. It's based on ignorance. But since we have to talk about it, let's talk about it. You've got beautiful hair, and I've got beautiful hair. You have beautiful skin, and I have beautiful skin. Okay, what's next? Oh, the, the wages are going down for Americans steadily. Oh, the top 10% of this country are keeping more of the money. Oh, there is no privacy in America. Did you really think there was? They now have your <laughs> cell phones. Okay, they know who you called. All right, let's not even try to delete. That's not going to help. So the, 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 the issue is how do we frame our, our responses to those questions? How do we frame our response to if it's even brought to us, you know? Oh, the Hispanic population is growing, and aren't you threatened? No, because I'm telling everybody we need to learn Spanish, OK? <laughs> we need to. It's 990% increase of Hispanic Americans in North Carolina alone. There is a coalition there waiting to happen, OK? So I don't understand their language. I need to learn it. They don't understand how I do whatever it is. They need to learn that. All right. So change the, the dialogue, the conversation. Change it. That's that's where that's where I would go with that. That's the discussion. I agree. But but what? to say they need to learn it. We agree. We agree. But to say that they need to learn it, that's really loaded. No, right. I need to learn Spanish, mm -hmm. okay? There has to be a common ground. Right. And as just as I in this society need to learn right. something, they need to learn something about me. It's a dialogue. I don't, I'm not Hispanic, right? Right, right? So I don't want to turn into a Hispanic. My mother would die. I just want to learn about them, right. and I want them to learn about They need to. Yes, but they, even though they need to, you have to get past the fact that they may not want to, right? Well, that's a true. Person, there's that's a person who may say, I, I don't want to. Uh, Negroes are this way, that way, the other. 
and that's a real feeling that I have based on what my eyes have seen. And so how do and so I, I keep going back to that because I'm like, how do we get to that? Person? Because I would say, how do you Thank say you hold can. up? How do you say hold up in Spanish? Hold up, okay? Let's, oh, okay, all right, all right, all right. Let's talk. Let's talk. That's all. I'm saying change the dialogue. That doesn't mean that you change the outcome, but you change the conversation. Change the dialogue. That doesn't mean that you change the outcome, but you change the conversation, right? We change the conversation. I disagree. He disagrees. But I found out he really does speak Spanish. So okay, all right. You know, I think important to your question also is phenotype, mm. because let's I mean let's be real, multiracial, biracial, whatever. I mean, there's some people who look who can pass, and there's some people who can't. And at the end of the day, those who can can access something that those who can't cannot. I have a colleague who is six uh, two, dark, shaved head from New Orleans unmistakably black he's unambiguous I on the head I I'm a big I'm ambiguous right I'm an ambiguous person so he says you know what angel you're accessing something that I'm not I said look I'm dark man I'm darker than your wife and he goes yeah but you know what shave your head shave your head and give it up <laughs> and then we all then then you will be accessing something and he's right he's right right and so at the end of the day phenotype matters such that um, people's position toward the issue and how they identify mm -hmm. matters. And so I think that we, we need to sort of take that into account, as well as take into account the fact that we all have biases mm -hmm. that we may be unaware of. Personal example, I have a friend who's a professor at UT, played college football, and we talk about football all the time. And we, you know, you sports hate people. I hate Kobe, I hate this person. And so I went down a list of people, you know, who I hate, and he says to me, you know what? Every time you hate a coach, it's a fat and black coach. <laughs> and I stood back and said, and he went down the list. And I said, damn, I'm fat blackest. <laughs> in that context, in that context, right? But I like Ty Willingham. I like uh, 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 Char 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 Strong, the Louisville coach, Char yeah. right? Char I like Char um, uh, the, the, the Lovey Smith. These are guys who are fit. They're black, but they fit. I didn't know I had that bias until he pointed that out. Yeah, what was the Minnesota coach? Dennis Green? Dennis Green. Oh, <laughs> I shouldn't do that. Um, well, and and, and I, I, I had to get behind my bias there. And I said, what is it that makes me uncomfortable about that? And after talking about it, it was, you know what? These black men are going into the homes of white uh, families trying to convince them to, to bring your son to my institution. Let me, let me father, in essence, father your son. And that made me uncomfortable because I felt that the white family didn't know how to interpret Denny Green. Hmm. They don't know how to interpret what they're seeing. I'm uncomfortable with that, right? I, uh, um, I had to get real with it, you know? Uh, we all have something like that. I'm comfortable admitting mine because I know we all have it. And so it's, it's once we admit that is when we get to the bottom of how to have real dialogue about changing those things. Thank you all for coming thank up this you. evening. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you.